Assalamu alaikum. Hi everyone. Um, I know it's been a while. Today we come back with a new presentation talking about um, sepsis, where we're going to try to identify what sepsis is um, and um, how common is it. How, what, if the, are there any red flags that would lead us to uh, suspect, sepsis, if, uh, suspect sepsis even more? And we're going to review some of the um, uh, pathways to manage sepsis as, uh, according to the Surviving Sepsis campaign uh, that was published um, in 2021 after being uh, established in 2020. And um, we're going to also look for any other uh, updates that we can discuss. So to define sepsis, we need to talk about prevalence as well, like how common is it? Uh, we know that we've got a wide range of infections in pediatrics um, and in um, childhood illnesses. About 5 to 10 percent of these infections, depending on the region you live in and um, uh, a lot of other factors, but about 5 to 10 percent are identified as severe bacterial infections. These infections, according to their severity, would initiate uh, what we call SERS, which is um, a systemic inflammatory response. Uh, where the child becomes febrile, possibly got tissue edema, possibly uh, lethargic, um, and a lot of, uh, and might respond from a hemodynamic point of view, being tachycardic or, um, um, you know, get in a fight or flight situation. And then, out of these, we get a group of children that develop sepsis, which is one percent of febrile children generally so again five to ten percent of all the infections that we get in children would be identified as severe bacterial infections and one percent of all the kids that present with fever about one percent would be true sepsis um, and out of these children with sepsis according to the management um, and the severity would go into septic shock which represents 10% of the PICU admissions um, and also represents up to 25% of the mortalities uh, in children. And give or take, that would be the same situation in a lot of countries and a lot of um, communities. So when we talk about that, so going, going back to what we just said about prevalence and uh, going back to what identifies each stage. So a child gets infected and then they develop fever, tachypnea, tachycardia, possibly get white cell count being up, which is where the when they are in the SERS phase. If that progresses into organ dysfunction, then that's sepsis. So let's say it develops into respiratory failure or it develops into a hypotension or it develops into um, renal shutdown, then we're getting into sepsis. But if you've got a combination of hypotension, impaired perfusion, needing inotropies, um, or needing uh, support to multiple organs, then you're definitely getting into a state of septic shock. And this is where, like, the, the, the zones where sepsis and septic shock come in play are the most concerning. And that's why we've got this talk. So now we know some identifiers about sepsis. How do we usually manage sepsis? Well, in the UK, we've got what we call sepsis six, which is basically reminding ourselves that for any child with suspected sepsis, we need to put some oxygen for um, support. We need to get blood culture and a lactate level. We need to start antibiotics as soon as possible empirically and possibly give a fluid bolus and monitor the urine output. The problem is, who are we going to start it to, uh, start this process to? Or, as I don't know if you've ever played this game, but where's Wally? Which child is sepsis? Where can we identify what, what we're looking for? Just in case you know the game, this is Wally down in the left uh, downside. But it's as difficult as finding Wally when you're looking for sepsis in children because again going back to what we do with sepsis 6 in the UK like most of our performance for sepsis would say this same statement is <coughs> one of the red flags present and you can see the list of the red flags on your right side 
search ad being done, responses to social queries, looking very ill to health professional, weak, high pitch or continuous cry, grunting, sounds of less than 90% and needing oxygen, severe tachypnea, severe tachycardia or possibly bradycardia, uh, having no wet nappies or not passing urine for the last 18 hours, uh, non-blanching rash or looking cyanotic, uh, temperature of less than 36 or if he's under three months, if the child's under three months and has got a temperature of above 38. And lastly, if you've got a capillary lactate above two, and I've put a tick there because let's think about that for a minute. That's a red flag. That's one red flag that would initiate sepsis six. How many, how many times did someone try to get a capillary uh, blood gas and ended up squeezing and getting a, a higher lactate than the true lactate? Would you initiate sepsis management for a child like this? Okay, let's take another scenario. What if um, we've got a child with severe tachycardia, severe tachypnea? and sats below 90%. Does it have to be sepsis? Doesn't that happen with any um, child that has got, let's say, bronchiolitis that is severe enough to get them to hospital? Or does it not happen with children with heart failures? And I remind you, sepsis 6 would say, give a fluid bolus, but what if the child's in heart failure and can't really tolerate fluid boluses? So it's a difficult question. Where do we draw the line? So this uh, study um, was published in 2020, and it, the focus was management of children with fever at risk for pediatric sepsis try, in, 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 in pediatric emergency care. And they were trying to identify how common is um, how, how common is uh, sepsis? And they found that 41% of the febrile children that presented with warning signs of sepsis would have been considered as sepsis. Um, and, and you can see how they've divided things. So uh, there's the APLS threshold, there's the NICE guideline amber category and the NICE guideline red category. And you can see that According to these guidelines, the definition of sepsis varies, doesn't it? But it's more sensitive in um, in the red category and the apulous thresholds for tachycardia. But again, does that really identify true sepsis? So I think all of you uh, might know that there are a lot of scoring systems in pediatric and trials to get the right scoring system for each diseases. Um, always uh, going f is a progressive um, uh, practice or a part of the ongoing research. So this was a trial to get a modified uh, QSOFA score to try to predict uh, critical care admission in febrile children. And then from that perspective, that would give you more insight about hmm, possibility of sepsis. And you can see on the left-hand side uh, that the um, criteria they used were capillary refill time um, alertness, heart rate, and respiratory rate. And the scoring system is either 1.4, something being abnormal, or zero points. And again comes the question, if I get your child with tonsillitis that got their temperature to 40, um, then their heart rate possibly and their respirate would be high. Their cap refill time might be uh, delayed, and they might look lethargic, which might get you a bit, you know, um, misled to think that they're not really alert. And we see a lot of them in ED. Does that mean that they're going to end up in ICU? So let's agree on the result here that diagnosis sepsis in pediatrics is simply difficult. No matter how much we invest into research, so far we haven't got to that point where we can really just say that clinically that this child or that child are septic or not. So what can we do about it is try to tackle the possibility of sepsis when it's coming up um, in practice as a, as, a, as a concern and have the ability to um, still manage to go back on management if the child is proven to not be septic. I would say is my my conclusion for all of this, and there and, and here comes 
one of the, the, the pathways that are really, um, I must say, like really commendable because this, this is like a, a, this is one of the biggest um, investments um, from, from, uh, of human intelligence. Um, as a lot of centers and a lot of consultants and a lot of researchers invested time and effort to come up with uh, surviving sepsis camp, uh, pathways and protocols, uh, which I think would help with managing uh, sepsis in different settings. So this is the Surviving Sepsis 2020. As I said, it was published early in 2021. And it's got different pathways than the old pra practices. So if you look here, it's divided into right-hand side and left-hand side. And what, what it says here, if you've got a child that you just suspect in sepsis, but it's, it's not a septic shock, so blood pressure possibly stable, and um, not in that state where you need um, ionotropic support, then you, you possibly can have three hours to try to tackle this and to be sure of what you're doing and still start initiating your sepsis 6 um, pathway possibly not as quick with some time to, to review results and see how things are. While if you've got a child with what you think is septic shock, then you should treat within the first hour of recognition or the first hour of presenting. And again, how do you tackle that? You tackle that by gaining IV or IO access. In both pathways, you're going to do the same. It's just the difference on uh, how urgent and how is it, uh, how critical is it. Because I would say maybe a child with suspected sepsis would be more likely to get an IV access than an IO in comparison to a child with septic shock where IO might come in early. You will need to collect blood, uh, blood cultures as soon as you get uh, any IV access. Start imp uh, empiric uh, antibiotics um, and while you wait for the culture to come back in 48 hours. Measure the lactate that you get from your venous blood gas if possible. Which would and that would be better than a capillary blood gas in that situation because of the peripheral perfusion. Administer fluid boluses, uh, especially if shock is present, and start vasoactive agents if shock persists. And this is basically the pathway. And you need to start to 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 um, just keep an eye on your time frames. So let's let's take each step one at a time. So for the IVIO axis, the new guidance is to um, make sure that you've only got three attempts for IV. Don't keep going for it. Don't keep just trying for a difficult IV axis because you're just losing time. You're just blowing veins. You're increasing the level of stress. If you don't get IV axis with your, th with your third attempt or the third attempt of the um, team members that are trying, just go for an IO. And if no one, if, if someone's listening and doesn't know what IO means, IO means intraosseous axis. Get a blood culture if it doesn't delay treatment, and that is stated in the guidance. Which, in in that case, it means let's say you've got an IV axis, a point of IV axis, and the blood is uh, not really coming easily, and you're struggling to get the blood that you need for the blood culture. You're just delaying treatment in that case. Or let's say you've got a point of access that didn't be back to begin with and then you don't want to give the IV antibiotics because you want to try for another point of access so that you can draw blood from then again you're delaying treatment and as we're talking about blood culture let's just have a stop here and think about antibiotic stewardship so why is it important to get blood culture because it's a critical decision you've got a child with temperature you don't, you presume that they're sick but you don't know how sick you don't know why they're sick Possibly it can end up being a viral infection. Um, and you don't know which antibiotic to give if it's a bacterial infection. So you send the culture and within 48 hours at best, you've got a result, if there is a result. And that would help you titrate your treatment. There are other things to help with this, which are your white cell count and CRP. They might help. Maybe not specific, but they can help. Then again, there's something that is more specific nowadays, which is procalcitonin. A lot of arguments are going about procalcitonin, but mostly because it's a bit expensive. So it, you can't use it in every setting and you can't use it in every part of the world. And I would say even in some of the um, well-developed 
settings. It's still difficult to use broadcast to that often. But it would be more specific in comparison to CRP and WASA account. And then there are st still some emerging um, markers that would help with identifying sepsis. And this is really promising. So we've got some um, uh, studies and research coming up with um, markers that are using um, RNA signatures, which would help to identify if it's a bacterial or viral infection. And they look really promising. So basically, what you're trying to do with your stewardship is um, weigh what's going on, um, uh, sorry, weigh what you're doing about responding um, to your suspicions uh, about sepsis and trying to keep the patient safe, but also not going too much with unnecessary antibiotics and over-treatment that would increase side effects and resistance and cost that would end up affecting the whole community, leading to... Um, less safety for the children in the community and the adults for all I know. Then we come to the next step, which is fluid and vasoactive drugs management. And this is the new part um, that they've added as well, where they would um, titrate your fluid according to where you are. So Back, back before uh, Surviving Sepsis 2020, the, all of the guidance was all about giving 20 milliliter per kilogram three times um, before thinking about inotropes, which means 60 mils per kilogram of fluid boluses. Now the guidance is to, according to your assessment and according to how unstable the patient is, you can go from 10 per kilo to 20 per kilo and reassess. And the maximum now is 40 mil per kilogram. And the type of fluid that we're using now, uh, uh, nowadays more often, and according to the guidance, is balanced crystalloids. So rather than using normal saline, we're trying to use more of plasma light or Ringer lactate. And the reason that we're trying to, um, there is good evidence uh, coming from uh, different aspects, uh, sorry, different studies, uh, that would say that hyperchloremia is, has got more morbidity and sometimes more mortality. Most, most of this evidence comes from the adult uh, data, but there is still good data coming in pediatric nowadays. So that would help with uh, keeping the child less hyperchloremic, if that makes any sense, would, which should help with the kidney status. And then the other piece of advice is um, to try to start adrenaline early, possibly after 40 milliliter per kilogram, um, of fluid and and the, the, there is very good evidence and now it's really strong evidence that it's quite safe to use adrenaline preferably in a, in a cannula even if you don't have central access and there's good evidence that starting it early would give you a better outcome and one thing I just wanted to add before we go to the last slide which is also remember from this slide that it Dep uh, the, your management is titrated with either having intensive care or not having intensive care. So if you've got uh, if you've got intensive care, then possibly giving more fluid, um, if you think that is useful, is still a bit safer. But if you're not having any intensive care to support you, then usually overloading the child with with fluid would be something that would compromise the safety until you get the child to an intensive care. Um, and again, it doesn't matter where you are, just think adrenaline. And if the child st starts to improve and the shock resolves, don't give further fluids at that point as boluses, just go for the maintenance and keep monitoring. So I think that the take home message is it's difficult to diagnose sepsis and not every child with um, tachycardia, tachypnea and fever would be septic because that's actually most of the children with any temperature above 39 degrees. But again, if you're in suspicion, always think about sepsis 6 and try to get your blood culture and your blood samples so that you can um, control the amount of antibiotics and the time of antibiotic, uh, the, uh, the sorry, the duration of antibiotics that you're giving. 
And remember to review the uh, Survive Success 2020 guidance. It's easy to Google and look for. Uh, and I would recommend that you all try to read the evidence. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a, uh, that you've had a good um, learning from this session. Thank you very much.